Well, good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone to turn off electrical devices or turn them to silent, please? Um, item one is a decision by the committee to take items three, four and five in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Um, I'll now ask for any declarations of interest that committee members have. And Kezia Dugdale. Thanks, Convener. If I can just declare I'm a member of Capital Credit Union, which is a member of ABCOOL, and I'm also a member of Castle Community Bank. Thank you. And John Mason. Well, if we're declaring credit union interest, I'm a member of Parkhead Credit Union. Thank you very much. Well, this morning we continue our inquiry into the impact of bank closures, and we have with us today a panel of witnesses um, whom I would like to welcome. First of all, Karen Hurst, who is the policy offer officer from Abgul Scotland, uh, Gordon Buchanan, the general manager of Castle Community Bank, Cathy Gregg, chair of UK Credit Unions, and Martin Kearsley, director of banking with the post office. So welcome to all four of you this morning. Thank you for coming in. Uh, and I understand, Martin Kearsley, you have also one of your colleagues, Mark Gibson, who's in the public gallery that you may confer with on particular issues as, as we progress. Now, the buttons and the everything will be dealt with by the sound desk, so no need to press any buttons. Um, do feel free to come in on any questions, but don't feel you have to answer all of them, and there will be an opportunity to submit further evidence in writing after the session if there are issues you feel you would like to add something to your evidence, what you've said today. Um, I'll start with a, a question, perhaps a general question, on the impact of bank closures. Um, can any of you comment on that impact of bank closures on businesses, uh, individuals in the wider community economy in areas that you are familiar with? Yeah. Gordon uh, Buchanan? Yeah, well, I think we've, we've, we've been doing some work with, uh, with a, a, a local group in, in, in Juniper Green and, and, and Curry who are concerned about the uh, the fact that there is literally no branches um, available in that part of uh, in that part of Edinburgh at all. Uh, no Bank of Scotland's, no Royal Bank of Scotland's. The last Royal Bank of Scotland closed quite recently. And attending a couple of public meetings with myself and the chair, um, I think we we notice there's a strong concern, especially amongst the local business community and also the the elderly community in 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 those parts of Edinburgh who. For the business community, there's a concern about being able to bank cash um, because there, there, there literally is nowhere, if the branch disappears, there's nowhere for them to actually bank the cash. And I think for the elderly community, there's also a, um, a concern about uh, they're used to perhaps going into their branch and actually transacting with somebody face to face. And for many of them, they're not even used to happy using an ATM, or never mind online <laughs> online banking. So there was real concern uh, that we picked up from 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 those two sectors um, of the of the community in that part of Edinburgh. Thank you, um, Martin Kearsley. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I we've certainly seen a, a significant growth in our business um, in supporting communities as bank branches close. Um, we essentially offer cash services to the local community. So what we don't do is set out to replace a bank. There are many services the banks have to continue to offer uh, about their own products, mortgages, life insurance, pension, and so forth, for which you need proper independent financial advice. But from a post office perspective, our role is to support the communities that we are, um, we are placed in. We have about 1,400 branches across Scotland. Um, we have modernized over 700 of them in the past few years, and we've got a stable network that hasn't been this stable in decades. Since 2009, uh, we've had about 1,440 branches, and that's now 1,403 or so. So we have a stable network that is there to support the communities. Uh, we offer cash services, so cash withdrawals and cash deposits. And when a bank branch closes, if there's still a bank branch in the town, we see a marginal increase in the business over our counters. When the last bank closes, that's when we see significant change. Um, we see something like a 10% um, a, a increase in cash withdrawals. So that's, uh, our logic for that is that all of us as individuals will find other ways to withdraw cash, either uh, supermarkets, cash back, ATMs, go to the next branch. We find different ways of collecting cash. But to Gordon's point, 
local businesses, they need a counter uh, in order to pay cash over. And we've seen about a 25% increase in business cash deposits uh, over the last year as a result of bank closures. Um, it's becoming a very uh, important part of our business. Uh, there are three business areas we focus on. Obviously, mails is the main one. Banking is second and travel is third. Our banking business is growing significantly uh, and is as a direct result of, um, of bank branch closures. And before we come to Cathy, Greg, is that uh, economically viable for the post office in terms of the banking transactions that you've seen an increase in? I think if, if we look at the percentage or the ratios uh, of, of those different types of transaction, withdrawals account for about 80% of all the transactions we do. Um, so those withdrawals are well remunerated, they are very quick and easy transactions and they normally happen at the end of some other transaction. So a customer will come to the counter, post parcels and at the end of the transaction postmaster will say, would you like some cash today? Uh, so it's, a, it's an add-on transaction, uh, very straightforward. The challenge is business deposits and because that's been growing so significantly we recognise that we have, to, we have to rebalance how we remunerate our postmasters. Business cash deposits coming in require counting. Uh, it requires um, uh, pre uh, preparation for remittance, uh, and we also expect postmasters to, to at least be the first stop in, in detecting counterfeits and frauds coming through. So there is a much heavier load on the postmasters to handle business deposits. Um, and that's the, that's the one that's growing fast, and that's the one that we're looking to, to rebalance. But we do recognise that the remuneration for business cash deposits coming in uh, is currently out of balance, and we are working to, to, uh, to fix that. Thank you. And Cathy Gray. Within my role in the Bail Leaving Credit Union, I work with other credit unions and they find now that they have to keep more cash in their premises because they can't get it banked easily and if members come in to take out money, they can't give them a cheque and send them to a local branch because there is no local branch now. So credit unions are now paying more insurance to keep more cash on premises. Members of the credit unions are now having to travel further to make deposits into their branches. One credit union has a 15 mile there and back to take their cash to deposit into a bank because there, there's no banks in their area. We also work with the schools a lot and we try to teach children how to save, but you can't follow up with, now you've got your money, you take it to the bank and this is where you put it. We have to do that on behalf of the pupils now because they have to travel, because they, they close down of the, the banks makes it very difficult to make cash deposits. We also have people coming into the credit unions to draw out £5 to travel to their bank when they have trouble with their account because they can't manage the, the computer to get through to speak to a human being. So we have people coming in lifting their small amount out of the credit union to help with the travel to get to the bank. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Karen Hurst, did you want to come in? Just to sort of reiterate what uh, both Gordon and Cathy said, we represent most credit unions in Scotland. Um, I was with a bunch of them last night and I, I asked a question and um, most of them agreed to see a, a significant increase in inquiries from the community of people who um, the banking service had been withdrawn and they were looking for alternatives. Um, for credit unions, it, it prompts some uh, challenges, some difficult questions, as, as Cathy said issues such as cash handling, um, transactional accounts, they're, they're not cheap to provide, so our credit unions are very much sort of looking at what they can offer um, whilst acknowledging those limitations to what they can do. Right, thank you. And now a question from Colin Beattie. Over the years we've seen very many bank closures and uh, it would appear that the high street banks uh, are on a continuing basis pulling back from the high street. We've got towns and villages who don't have banks at all. Doesn't this create an investment opportunity for the post office and credit unions to move in behind the retreat of the banks and take advantage of that? Um, I would say taking advantage is possibly a bit too much. Uh, I think what we, we would emphasise is that obviously there is an industry in huge change, probably a once in a generation change, and that reflects how all of us consume banking services these days, same way as we consume any other service. We research online, you look at reviews, you make your choices. So I think the banks are making a change, and without apologising for them in the slightest, they're, rec they're reflecting the change in how we consume banking. That does give us an opportunity, maybe not to take advantage, but to support the communities that we serve, to be the place where cash can be deposited, cash can be accessed. Um, there is no need to travel to the next town, 
absolutely uh, you can go to the post office in that town. We have invested uh, a significant sum over the past few years in um, modernising the post office network uh, in Scotland. As I said, we've met, we've modernised about 700, nearly 800 of the 1,400 branches we have. Um, we have moved to change the way we handle banking transactions. So we have note counters, we have um, uh, we have time saver pouches in terms of how business customers can deposit cash uh, more quickly instead of having to, to wait while the money's counted uh, at the counter. We're starting to work with credit unions to offer broader services to a wider group of customers so they don't have to withdraw five pounds to travel to the bank. Um, in doing so, we're also working with um, government, both national and regional, to raise awareness. And I think the problem is one of awareness. Um, if you look at the RBS closure plan, 45 of the branches that they're closing are within 100 yards of a post office. So far be it from us to force people to use a post office, but if we can make it a welcoming and a secure and a safe environment, one that's beneficial to the postmaster and the community, there is no need to travel several miles to go to the nearest bank branch. For those daily transactions that keep the local economy fueled, there's the post office. Yeah, just to sort of comment on the credit union uh, perspective there. Um, so for us, um, some of the challenges are that um, the sort of, firstly, for, as a sector and in particular for us as a trade association, we're very much keen to move forward to grow the sector, to become more relevant to our members, um, to provide a wider range of services. The problem is that we, we all live in an economy where there's the expectation of uh, banking services being free. Um, so your your current accounts, your cash service, all those kind of things, there's no expectation that those will be paid for. Um, so they need to be subsidised from elsewhere, which a bank will typically do by um, providing other services. We're unique in financial services in that where the legislation says both that we can't charge, um, we're limited in the interest rate, but more importantly, we're restricted in what range of services we can provide. So we can't, for example, provide credit cards, we can't do... Um, we can't provide insurance. For us as a trade body, that's a priority um, to try and get reform of the Credit Unions Act to try and allow us to be more relevant to members. But in the meantime, it means sort of difficult decisions, as Cathy says, as to how much cash we can keep on our premises, what what um, what we can offer in terms of transactional accounts. So, um, as I say, we, we're sort of hoping to move forward and to grow the sector so that those decisions become easier. But it's got to be seen as a journey. It, there's no sort of easy solution there. And Gordon Buchanan. Yeah, I mean, I think we are, we're, we are, to Mr. Beattie's point, we are picking up on some of the, I think credit unions are seeing um, a transfer of savings from um, from the big banks to, to credit unions. I think people are disillusioned with the bigger banks um, because of the bank closure programme, because of the way they're in general, may be treated by the big banks, and so they're 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 walking with their feet as far as they're, they're voting with their feet as far as the savings is concerned, and they're definitely we're seeing anecdotally the maximum deposit we as we can accept is fifteen thousand pounds, but we're seeing a number of people walk in the door with cheques for fifteen thousand pounds, saying, "I'm leaving RBS, I'm leaving Santander um, because of the way that I'm treated by them." So we are we are picking up on that, but to to, to Karen's point, um, the idea that we can somehow start offering uh, money transmission accounts and offering current accounts with direct debits and standing orders is, is, is very difficult because those accounts tend to be very expensive to run. Um, a, I think Karen picked up on the point about cross-selling, and I think you probably find that the, the banks will say, and I, I think there's some truth in this, that they don't actually make any money out of running current accounts. What, they, what the current accounts provide them with is data about ser other services that they can cross-sell to you, like insurance or mortgages or, um, or the like. So it's, it's, it's hard for credit unions to step into that space without, as Karen alludes to, significant funding uh, from central government. And also legislative reform because the current act doesn't allow for uh, the sector to offer those services. We took evidence. We were people talked about challenger banks, uh, which are actually quite small. Whether they could step up and step in, and the feeling was that simply because of their size and the the investment that's needed to actually open a, an all singing, all dancing uh, branch of a bank, that that was a complete 
No, no. But is there a, a lower key approach here? Now, the post office in part has already done that. But is there any solution that in a combination would replace the services that banks currently offer on the high street? If, if I could um, take that one. I think the, the points raised by my fellow panellists are very relevant in terms of vulnerable um, and potentially you know, the weakest members of our society and how we serve them. Um, we are within a mile of 99.7% of all urban deprived areas. We'd all recognise we have post offices uh, in some of the uh, some of the, the you know the, the, the deeper parts of, of most villages and towns. Um, our role serving those members of the community uh, is, is is really significant and growing. And at the moment, to give the, the committee a sort of an example, we're working with the Department of Work and Pensions because at the moment there is a post office card account, a thing called POCA, which is of huge value to some very, very vulnerable people, those with chaotic lifestyles, uh, those without credit history, those who can't get access to a, to a normal bank account. But in moving from the POCA product, which DWP want to do, there is no option at the moment apart from to go to a bank account, which, as my colleagues have said, is an expensive proposition, and many of those customers can't make the jump. They can't get past the, the Know Your Customer uh, regulations. So in working with credit unions to be able to offer, and those challenger banks, to be able to offer a branch network uh, that essentially replaces the investment that they need to make, so they don't have to go and create a branch network. There is already one of 11,500 branches, 1,400 in Scotland. Um, we can offer services over the counter that any normal bank branch would offer to keep the cash going. To that end, we're working with the credit unions at present to be able to move from full service bank accounts down through basic bank accounts and down into credit union accounts, which will give a lifeline proper transactional accounts with a six-digit sort code and an eight-digit account code, so they can be um, uh, universal credit, uh, can be paid onto those accounts, direct debits can be set up from them. Those customers who can, who can make that uh, step can access the kind of lower, uh, lower rate utility bills that we can all enjoy. So in a way, we're eroding the poverty premium by being able to give access to those customers. And that's something that we're, we're very proud to work with the credit union uh, organisations with and the challenger banks to, to bring to service in the next, uh, next six months or so. So your focus on that particular aspect is in helping the vulnerable members of society, which is really important. But there is a huge block of people out there that are looking for alternatives also that are disaffected with the banking services they get and with the attitude of the banks, and they're looking for an alternative. Is the post office going to be a credible alternative? Have you, have you got that level of investment that would allow that? Um, we, we have in terms of servicing all partner banks, credit unions, building societies, um, and uh, anyone who wishes to make use of a, of a counter service in order to, to transfer cash to and from. Um, in terms of creating uh, a post bank, for instance, um, obviously, with banking regulations and legislation as it currently is, uh, the investment into the post office would have to be in the billions in order to create a strong enough balance sheet that would pass banking regulations to be able to prove, ca prove capital adequacy, to be able to support the FS, uh, the, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. Um, and in doing so, investing that much money would require us to have many millions of direct customers the only place we could get those customers from would be the existing banks and communities that we already serve. So there's a circularity involved in saying, let's just create an alternative uh, from scratch. Um, the, the challenge that we'd have there is that we would we'd effectively alienate all the customers that we already serve in trying to move them across. So th there are some real challenges in trying to create what you might call a viable alternative to replace the, the, the daily services that we already offer. So whilst we continue to, to look at and watch and, and try and understand uh, how we would modify uh, in order to create something like that, I think the, the, there are some serious barriers at present which would require significant investment to, uh, to try and overcome. I think we can just pick up on a point about the POCA, about the, uh, the post office uh, cash accounts and the DWP's efforts to get people to close those accounts and move to normal bank accounts. And it's just a point about the branch closures, when the branch closes, and I think this is an important thing that we'll probably come to later on perhaps, is that the ATM goes as well, so people don't have access to their, they don't just not have access to the branch any longer, they actually don't have physical access to the cash, because they, um, and, and often when people do are successful in opening 
um, a bank account with RBS or whatever and they're moving from a POCA, they'll be given a basic bank account. So they'll be given a cash card rather than a debit card. So the only way that they have access to their funds is by cash. Um, and I, so I think that's quite, an, that's quite an important point around branch closures and the ATM disappears at the same time. And uh, now John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I mean, I think I'm particularly interested in some of the post office stuff, but some of the other questions will come up. I mean, can you explain to us the difference between we've got post office money, and is it actually a bank, or is it just is it linked to there's AIB you've got a relationship with, I think, as well. Is that right? And then, but also you can go into other bank accounts. I could come in with my whichever bank I'm with and yes. uh, do some transactions. So can you just explain how that all fits together? I can. Um, so post office money, you're quite right. It's actually a relationship with Bank of Ireland. Um, post office money is a kind of a rebranded set of Bank of Ireland products. So that's where you could quite happily have uh, a current account with the post office. You can have uh, mortgages, insurance, uh, life insurance, pensions and so forth. They are separate products that we sell through the post office. Um, typically in the last few years we've tried to sell them over the counter. Uh, but as many of you will know, you walk into post office with a transaction in mind, I want to do what I'm doing today and go somewhere else. I'm in to post something, I'm in to whatever. Um, so the chance to say, well, whilst you're buying a stamp, would you like a mortgage, is, is a pretty significant leap. So selling in store really doesn't work too well. So what we now do is we, we may start the journey in the, in the branch, but then it's completed online or it's completed through conversations with help centres and so forth. So that's post office money, a separate set of products that we sell to customers who wish to have a post office, uh, a post office product. But they are essentially Bank of Ireland products behind us. <coughs> On the part of individuals and businesses, uh, that's it's, it's individuals. Uh, that right. that it's not business. It's not uh, business. Right. Okay. It's, it's, it's us as personal consumers. Right. Um, on the partner banking side, we offer a thing we, we created a few years ago called the Banking Framework. Uh, essentially for 20 years plus, ever since Jira Bank days, which has morphed into Santander over time, we've provided cash in and cash out services for all banks. Um, they became incredibly fragmented over the past few years, different banks, different requirements, different services, you know, uh, uh, whether it's a barcode or whether it's a, a mag stripe card or whether it's a chip and pin, various different services. So we standardized it all about two years ago and said to all the banks, if you wish to use a post office, your customers will have to be chip and pin. So it is essentially the same thing as using an ATM. It's a, it's a card into the machine, pin, amount of money, and away we go. So we've standardized and simplified the services, and we offer that service for all banks. So that's, we, we say about 99% personal customers and about 95% of small businesses, you can access your current account through any post office. Um, yeah, so that, they're, they're the two different types of service. One is a partner banking relationship, and one is a specific set of products that we can, that we can sell. Okay, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm unusual, but I mean, I, I don't go into my bank either looking for a mortgage or insurance or any of these things. I just want to get my money in and out of my current account and basically that's it. Are there any limitations on what you can do? I mean, businesses were suggesting to us that there were limits how much change they could get at a time or how much they could deposit at a time. Yep. Are there limits on these and if so, why? Um, okay, so uh, with apologies to the panel for the detail and do please stop me if this gets uh, too, too detailed. Um, we offer a service, basically an ad hoc walk-in service for all businesses. And about 90 plus, 92, 93% of all business deposits are less than 2,000 pounds. So we have, you can walk into any post office and deposit up to 2,000 pounds into your account anywhere in the country. Um, there are many businesses that, that go way above that each week. Around about 4,000 of our 11,500 branches take in over 80% of our business deposits. So those branches are the ones that we invest in in terms of fortress. You might recognize the sort of, the, the sort of perspex windows and a, a specific area where business deposits can be made. So they're the ones that we will direct customers with larger sums of money each week. We will locate them. It's called a location exercise. We work with the bank and that customer, and we introduce the postmaster to the business and say, if you want to take 20, 30, 50,000 pounds a week and deposit it on a Thursday, you've got to go to this post office. They'll welcome you. They can take the money securely. We can, we can safe it and, and dispose of it. Um, so there is a limit of 2,000 pounds for any post office, but uh, in, in specific areas uh, and in, across those 4,000, we can take any sum that, the, uh, that the, the, the business cares to deposit. So in that case, there are no limits, if you like. It just has to be arranged. Um, 
And I think um, any other limits. In terms of cash, uh, there are, again, no limits. If a small business wants to withdraw coin and cash for an opening float or for, um, for sort of maybe um, you know, temporary workers through the, through the summer season, maybe, uh, to pay cash to workers, uh, you, can, you can draw any amount of cash you wish. What we ask for is 48 hours notice so we can provide literally a block of change and they come in house brick sized lumps of coin. We'll deliver that to the, uh, to the branch and that can be collected by the customer. So it just requires pre-arrangement for some of the larger sums. Um, but that, if, if, if a small business doesn't know that, and we're back to the point about awareness, if the small business doesn't know how to operate their account through us, we're very happy to help, but we need to raise awareness collectively, the banks and the post office and government. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks. If I could switch to the credit unions then. I mean, am I right in saying, because you've, you've all said a little bit about credit unions, that there is a huge variety and that some are pretty big and almost like a bank and some are absolutely tiny and seem to provide very few services. Am I misunderstanding that or is that correct? Yes. Well, there's huge variation in credit unions, as you say. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I mean, the smaller ones probably just do the, the savings and loans, um, which is uh, sort of what, what credit unions sort of uh, is in debt to us. So, yeah. I've got, for example, in my constituency, I've got the police credit unions based there, and yeah. they strike me as quite a big professional kind of thing. Yeah, so they're and then a, Glasgow, I don't know what it is, what it's actually called in Glasgow now, but there's a huge one that used to cover, I think, everyone in Glasgow or the council or Scott whatever. West. Scott West and Glasgow Scott Credit West. Unions. Glasgow's right. the biggest credit union in the UK. Yes. Yeah. So, and am I right in saying that then they provide more services than my little Parkhead one? Yes, they will. Although, as I said earlier, the the challenges the, the legislation. So the, the main act that bounds us is the Credit Unions Act. It, it basically says that we can order offer savings and loans. Um, a couple of services around that. So for example, it's typical if you take out a loan, you would get insurance as, as part of that package. Um, and in most cases, if you, your savings will be insured as well. Um, they cannot, a few um, credit unions offer mortgages as well, although um, it's very few. But they couldn't offer the sort of, and obviously they can do transactional accounts. But the, the, as I mentioned earlier, there's challenges around the costs of that and how they, um, how they make that sustainable. Um, we so some do debits and standing orders, and some don't. Uh, in terms of direct debits, you would probably be the. Yes, many would offer that. It wouldn't be into a current account, as you might expect with a bank. It's what usually happens is there's a sort of prepaid card that's offered through the credit union. Um, many people have their benefits and sometimes their salaries paid into the credit union account. That's transferred onto the prepaid card and that can be used, um, you know, payments can come off of that and it can be used in the way you may, may use a debit card. But I couldn't pay my TV licence or my that kind of thing through my credit no, union account, no. no. And the, and the problem, just to pick up on the prepaid cards, the problem with a lot of the prepaid cards is that the, the cash machines that you go to with those prepaid cards, you get charged £1.50, £2 for actually taking the money out of the of, of, of that hole in the wall. So again, the people who are the most vulnerable, the most least able to afford uh, those charges are being, are being charged for using those prepaid cards. I, think I would just add to that. I mean, it's been invaluable, I think, for the sector to be able to offer um, a service to people who would otherwise not be able to access bank accounts. Um, that's mainly why we've sort of embraced it, because uh, so many of our members were uh, making a purchase, and, and this was what we could see as the best solution. I think my final question then, how, how many people in Scotland are members of credit unions? Because I think we've, we've got two of the committee have declared today that they are. I don't know if that means it's all about, the others aren't. But hang on, I'll just uh, find my evidence. It's about 7% of the population. 7%, which is quite low. Yes, it, it's better than the rest of the UK. It's about 2% in England and Wales. But uh, clearly it's... Uh, H higher in Ireland? Uh, in Ireland, membership is higher, yep. The, the credit union sector is very well developed there. OK, thanks so much. Come to Kizia, Doug Dale now. Hi, it's 24% in Northern Ireland is the last figure I saw. Um, good morning, panel. Um, I've been in the Castle Community branch in Granton. I've been in the one in Craig Miller, and I was delighted to be at your opening in Leith two weeks ago. Why are you opening a branch in Leith when everybody else is moving out? Precisely because everyone else is moving out. <laughs> Away from it. Um, well, we make, we make money from, from lending. Um, and um, and and obviously we're, you know we're there as a savings and loans uh, business. Just picking up on what uh, Karen was saying, you know we don't offer any of the 
of the other services, we don't offer those um, prepaid debit cards precisely because we think that being charged money to, to take money out of the hole in the wall is a, is, is, is a nonsense. So um, we provide savings and loans, um, and um, it's, it's the lending basically that the, we, we make our money on. Um, we would lend up to seven and a half thousand pounds and a minimum of two hundred and fifty pounds, and we see a whole raft of people from um, from up to seven and a half thousand to two hundred and fifty. Communities I've named are obviously fairly deprived communities. Could you explain for uh, the record's benefit why it's actually quite important for credit unions that people with means are also members and use credit unions to borrow? Yeah, we don't. We, we're very conscious that credit unions are sometimes seen as being a poor man's bank, um, and 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 a sort of a, you know a lender of last resort. And we want to get away from that. We're there for for everyone in the community in Leith, and Leith is a very diverse community. There's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of wealth in, 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 in that part of Edinburgh. So we're there for everybody. Um, and it's really important that people who are uh, who may have who may have a choice about where they borrow from, um, it's really important that they consider credit unions um, as a source of as a source of funding for their new car or their new kitchen. Um, we offer competitive interest rates, rates that are competitive with the big banks. Um, and so, uh, and that lending to the, to the, to the, to, 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 to people who have a choice, um, allows us to do more lending to the people who don't have a, uh, the, to the people who don't have a choice. So, in, in all honesty, I, I despite being a, a cooperative MSP, one of the main reasons uh, that I joined um, Capital Credit Union first was it was harder to take my money out, and therefore I was less likely to spend it. Um, <laughs> But, but the, the, the truth is, now that um, you are as competitive as banks, it makes a lot of sense for me to borrow from my credit union yep. uh, as well. Um, but I guess in order to appeal to, I guess, more middle class communities rather than just serving poor communities, you need to have the same functionality as high street banks do. So I know that a couple of years ago, a huge amount of money went to Abcool to modernise your IT systems. Can, can you talk to us about how that's working? Um, is it now possible for people to access their credit union accounts on phones, for example, in the same way I might expect to with my Bank of Scotland account? Like, What's missing there in terms of the functionality with high street banks? I mean, there's definitely a need for... Um, to keep pace with that technology, that that, that techno technological advance, and and to, to answer your question, no, we don't have an app. Um, the kind of money that we'd be, you know, that would be required in order to develop an app, is 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 prohibitive for us in terms of the capital that we've, in, in terms of the capital we've got. We do have a very strong online presence. It's about to get stronger. We're launching a new website very soon, um, where people can apply for loans online and get an instant decision. Um, 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 but uh, we we can't accept deposits online. We can't um, we can't um, make people can't transfer money online. But the money, money that came to Abcool to modernise IT that was government money. So is there not a role for there to be government support in helping to modernise some of the the IT infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, that 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 project proved to be uh, pretty challenging. It, it's still ongoing. Um, although the DWP were no longer in contract with them, um, the. I think it's moving in that direction. Uh, we certainly, when our members get together at conferences and so on, you know, that's, that's very much the direction of the sort of the conversation. It's something um, I think even the smallest credit unions are now exploring and, and looking to improve on. Um, it, it's difficult without, as you say, um, without the kind of margins that a bank might have. So, um, yeah, we would certainly encourage any government, if it uh, felt it could, to be talking to the sector about investment in that area. Um, but I think it's, it's, there's a lot more options out there. There's a lot more credit unions exploring it. And yeah, it's definitely something, um, the direction we want to move in. Finally, convener. Craig, did you sorry. want to come in sorry. to comment? All oh, right, sorry, Kezi, thank you. Just uh, finally, convener, and one of the reasons I was so happy to see Castle Community Bank set up in Leith is that there's 11 uh, payday lenders within the centre of Leith. And y y some credit unions, capital credit union, provide things like fast cash where you can access up to £500 a day in the same minutes as you would a payday loan. I know there's a debate within the credit union community about whether or not you want to promote such unsustainable forms of finance like that. Could you remember to talk to us about how important you think it is to be able to access same day lending in small amounts so that you can compete with companies like Bright House versus trying to properly uh, focus on more sustainable uh, lending? Cathy, maybe hear from you on that. Within my own credit union, two years ago, we launched the instant, the instant loan, where 
a member doesn't necessarily have to have a saving history to join and sorry and uh, access funds for the credit union this is because we had a a leaflet drop from not a payday lender but a doorstep lender in one of our poorer areas so we went behind them and done our own leaflet drop that's it <laughs> i can see it you can't <laughs> And take £500 for the credit union, you'll pay back £36. Take £500 from Provident, you'll pay back nearly a thousand. Yeah. So it's no comparison. But the credit unions need to be of a level where they're geared up to do that. They have to have the things in place to assess the loans. Sometimes they need staff. A lot of credit unions don't have paid staff, so they work with volunteers. And that's quite a responsibility for a volunteer to take on, to assess a loan or put in a new product. But most credit unions are trying to move along that line because we're trying to conduct a combat the illegal moneylender, which we know can be a problem in a lot of a lot of our areas. We've actually paid money to a member to help pay off, and we've reported it on. So credit unions have a a big responsibility in that area. From my experience with the credit unions we work with, most of them are trying quite hard to help combat the, the issue of Highlanders. Thank you. I'm curious, Lee, did you wish to come Thank up? you, Convener. Um, I just wanted to, to come in on a couple of comments from my colleagues here. Gordon, you just mentioned that there's a number of things that can't be done by credit union customers online. You can't withdraw cash. You can't get access to your accounts, um, apart from seeing you know, what might be in there. Um, very important for us is, is, is to try and help the credit unions be able to offer services uh, at sensible interest rates, and we just heard some of the, the more extreme examples. Um, so if we look at, again, if we look at the POCA customer base, there are a large group of remaining customers in POCA who have some very significant balances. Uh, in aggregate, there is around about one and a half billion pounds worth of um, credit balance from customers in POCA um, <coughs> who are being encouraged to move elsewhere. Uh, in moving from POCA to a credit union account, they will take with them their balance. So as that 1.4 billion breaks down into individual amounts, it will move with that customer, with their account, to, to a new provider. Um, to be able to provide access to credit union customers um, from a post office in all of those deprived areas that we just talked about uh, is, is one of our fundamental starting points. And if we can assist in moving the POCA customers to a credit union to take with them their, their credit balance, then maybe gives the credit unions the opportunity to earn more from the balance and therefore be able to uh, offer out better loans and different loans and different products, um, thus again helping to break down some of those, some of those poverty principles. Um, so it's really just saying that in, it's a combination between offering a branch network to an organisation that is offering ethical finance to the, the most vulnerable, uh, and I think all of us have a role to play in, in how that's actually delivered uh, into those communities. No, it's not. And sorry, I didn't mean to imply it. it's just about poor people. Absolutely. Some of the people with pocket cards are very wealthy people. And as, as, as uh, Gordon said, this is not about a, a, you know, a bank for poor people. Um, it is an ethical choice. Absolutely right. Thank you. And now, Jackie Bailey. Uh, like just on the back of what you've just said, make the observation that it wasn't that long ago that post offices were closing down branches as well. So you know, I think a degree of caution is required that that isn't necessarily the entire answer because some communities have nothing at all. Um, can I talk to the community banks and credit unions first? Because it, it sounds from what you're saying there is a desire to provide more services. Okay, So I need to understand, as, the, as does the committee, what's stopping you? Is it legislation? Is it financial support to develop infrastructure? What is it? Yeah, a mixture see, of all? See, I would see both of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay. Yeah. So what would need to change? I mean, as we've got a couple of sort of, um, <coughs> priorities as, as a trade association. Firstly, as I mentioned, we were seeking legislative reform in Westminster um, to try to enable, enable us sorry, um, to offer a, a wider range of services. Um, we've also got some concerns about uh, recently introduced capital requirements. So um, credit unions, the larger credit unions, they've got a new requirement of temp to hold 10% of capital. Mm -hmm. For those who are on the cusp of that kind of threshold, it, it's, it's a difficult kind of uh, chicken and egg situation. You can't sort of uh, get the capital without serving more people, but you're restricted in how many more people you can serve because you don't have the capital. Um, and also, um, 
investment in the sector. As I say, capital is a big issue. We've been working with uh, Lloyds Bank for a number of years, and they've invested a lot of money um, in credit unions who are, who are lacking capital, and also smaller grants for um, sort of things that will help them grow, for example, technology. Um, that's coming to an end, although there's the, um, the DWP, uh, no, sorry, the Department of Adult, uh, Culture, Media and Sport, um, they've got a, um, a new 55 million financial, financial inclusion fund, so we're working with them to try and have some sort of similar arrangements in place to support the sector to help it grow. In terms of the Scottish Government, um, there's uh, they've announced last year in the Programme for Government that there would be a credit union awareness campaign, so we're sort of working to work with them on that. I think it'll be launched later this year. And I think maybe just sometimes visibility, that's, that's the biggest challenge, as, as we sort of discussed earlier. 7% is, is better than the rest of the UK, but it's, it's actually very low. And um, we think there's you know a huge potential to grow um, our sector to offer uh, savings and loans fundamentally to know more people, but with a kind of long-term view to be able to serve uh, in a wider range of services as well. Okay. I take it there's agreement at, at, across all three of you on that point. Okay. Scottish Government used to have a development fund for credit unions. Does that exist anymore? Uh, no, I don't know. No. Well, Carnegie, Carnegie Trust have, have recently launched a, a, a loan fund, yeah. which a uh, million pounds that they've put into it, and I believe the Scottish Government have matched that. That match that million pounds, but um, uh, that's the only uh, you know loan fund that I'm aware that I'm aware of at the moment. I'm old enough to remember there was one previously, and if my memory's right, there was there was much more than maybe one or two million in it. Um, I think it went into double figures, but it strikes me that some of the kind of capital investment you're talking about in infrastructure that would benefit all credit unions, such as the development of apps or you yeah. know digital platforms for you, is something that could conceivably be be done by government. Um, can I just tease out some of the bank stuff? Because, of course, credit unions bank with banks. Um, how helpful are they in actually, you know, working with you as a customer of theirs, given that you are a local branch? Cathy? I think it varies. I think it varies with whatever bank you're banking with. Can I say banks? Is that allowed? The Bank of Scotland is quite good with the credit unions. They don't charge for depositing money in. They don't charge for writing cheques. Other banks do. Other banks charge as much as 30 pence, 40 pence for a credit union to write a cheque for a member to lift their money out, which impacts greatly on the, the credit union's profits. They also have to pay to deposit their money in so much per thousand. Now, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but from what I can gather, a credit union that joins the Bank of Scotland now will have the charges, but they don't charge credit unions that's been with them a while. We've been banking with them for about nearly 40 years now, so we have a good working relationship, but I work with other banks that are actually struggling to manage the banking fees. So, so there are credit unions <coughs> who are picking up the slack in towns where the banks have left, and you're being charged for the privilege of even paying your money into the That's bank. That's it. Uh -huh. That's extraordinary. Yep. yep. Okay. And we also are in the unique position now be that our money isn't protected in the bank because we lost the compensation. We we don't have that now. So although our members' money, if the credit union went bust, the members would get their money back. If if the bank goes bust with the credit union holds its funds, the credit union will probably go because there's no compensation for the credit union's funds. Okay. So there's a role, if we want to see credit unions in the future, um, spreading across communities and going where, where banks don't go, we need to strengthen the financial and the legal framework that you guys operate under. Okay. Um, can I ask, um, it, I suppose we're reacting just now to, to the immediate branch closures. I have no doubt in my mind, despite what various committees have said and various governments have said, the bank closures will continue. Do you see yourselves as the bank branches of the future. Are you um, capable of replacing those bank branches? Do you want to? And that question's open to everybody. So maybe we'd start with Martin. Um, I'd be delighted. Um, uh, we do not replace bank branches. Uh, we don't set out to replace the branch. Um, in effect, this is not about us supporting banks in any way. This is about us supporting communities that we serve. And as I mentioned earlier, our real focus is making sure that the, 
the money that that's revolves in the local economy stays in the local economy, and that's, that's proven in, in numerous reports. So obviously if the money moves out of town, it's not coming back. So our role is very, is very firmly to support the communities in those daily transactions that they all need to survive. Um, it is not about providing other bank services, as we talked about earlier, things like uh, you know, a Lloyds mortgage or a Bank of Scotland pension. or a, you know, th Those services still have to be supported by those individual banks. Our role is to support the communities by giving access to those bank accounts through our counters. So we, we, we welcome being a branch, but not necessarily being a bank. Karen? I think perhaps we would see credit unions as, as part of a solution, hopefully, but I'm not sure I could say that we would see ourselves as, as the solution. I mean, I think the problem with, if if you wanted that to happen, if you wanted us to be the, the, the uh, you know, the, the replacement for the retail banks, firstly, it would require all the credit unions to actually potentially uh, merge and become one credit union. and. Karen as well. I think that that, that is that is that is a huge ask in the first in the in the, in the first instance. Um, and secondly, I think that in doing so, credit unions would lose their local community focus. Uh, they would become because of the because of the capital structures and the um, liquidity and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, that, that Martin alluded to earlier on that would be required for that. I think a credit union, that, that that merged credit union would just become like another mega bank, and it would lose its identity. It would lose its community focus, and I think that's I think that's very important. So yeah, to Karen's point, I think we're part of the solution, but we're I don't think that credit unions are actually going to be able to replace the high street banks. So your message is keep bank branches open. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, convener. Gordon MacDonald. And on that uh, message of keep bank branches open, I, I'm wanting to look at um, the post office to see, you know, if if there is a real potential there for um, them to continue to provide a service to the community. Um, there's 1,400 branches uh, you mentioned that are in Scotland. How many of them are sub postmasters? as in franchises, as opposed to main post offices? Uh, I don't have that information, afraid, but I will um, write Would you say it was a substantial proportion? Oh, it's it? a substantial proportion. We work right. with, um, uh, there are something like, across the country, out of our 11,500 branches, there's 300 uh, owned branches, what mm -hmm. you may have known as crowns, they're now called direct managed branches, mm -hmm. DMBs. Um, of the remainder, Probably 80 to 90 percent would be would be uh, agencies, whether independent mm. businesses in retail outlets, convenience stores, yeah. running post offices, um, and then the re the rest would be in third party partners, W H Smiths, McCall's, yeah. and so forth. So yeah. I think well, I will come back to the committee with uh, with yeah. with a written response on that one. And in terms of services provided, um, uh, is it the same level of service between the main post offices and the sub post postmasters? Uh, as I uh, explained earlier on, there are certain services which are absolutely ubiquitous. So every customer of every bank can get every service in every post office. Um, where we have particular outliers, and that's um, typically larger businesses that want to bank with a uh, submit a uh, sort of deposit their cash through a post office, uh, we will make specific arrangements. But pretty much, as I said, up to that two thousand pound limit, any post office. Uh, up to the amount of cash and coin each day, any post office. Uh, withdrawals up to the amount that your cash card will, will allow from your bank, any post office. So there is a ubiquity of service across our estate, uh, which yeah. should be serviced in every possible post office. How, what conversations take place with a local sub-postmaster um, when a branch closes? Because you know we've had wholesale branch closures in my constituency, mm -hmm. uh, bank branch closures, and the banks have always said, we've got an arrangement with the post office. But when you go and speak to the sub-postmaster, nobody has spoken to mm -hmm. the sub-postmaster. So what steps are put in place by the post office to contact the sub-postmaster when a branch closes, yeah. a bank branch closes? Yeah. Um, to a certain extent, it depends on how, um, how willing to communicate with us the bank is. Uh, in some of the banks, um, very close communication. And in those instances, we work with the bank to identify our nearest four or five post offices, and we talk very specifically to each and every one of those postmasters or mistresses about the services that are likely to come to their branch. Um, in which case, 
we're well geared up. In several other cases, the banks are less communicative and uh, um, announcements just happen, in which case we are caught out. We don't have that level of communication from them, so we have to then run around after the event and talk to the local postmaster mistresses and explain what's happening. So it, it does depend very much on the bank's willingness to communicate. Uh, in many cases, uh, I would say the vast majority, um, we have something like 12 to 14 weeks worth of notice before a local branch closes. In other words, it's after they've made the announcement, after they've uh, you know, discussed it with, uh, with Unite and various other stakeholders, and it becomes public knowledge. Then we then hear about it and we, we start to work with the postmasters uh, around that area. And in terms of that 12, 14 week window, when you are made aware of it, what, what do you do in local communities to raise the awareness of services that are available to the community if a bank branch closes? Um, at the moment, we work with the, the closing bank. Uh, typically, we put our postmaster mistress in touch with that closing bank branch manager. Um, for some of the most vulnerable customers, we effectively, in some cases, literally walk them to the post office, show them, introduce them to the staff, show them what services they can access. And this might be either uh, physically disabled or, or mentally challenged or just financially less aware um, customers. We make sure they're very specifically handled uh, in, the, in the migration. Um, moving into the general population, uh, the bank typically writes to every one of the customers of that local area um, and informs them of the closure. Uh, again, it does depend on some banks. We've seen the worst instances have been a piece of paper with a handwritten arrow on it saying post office is around the corner. Uh, we try to do better than that. Um, so with writing to the customers, uh, with our own branch managers, we, we run particular campaigns in the branches. We will put up uh, information sheets uh, specifically addressing Bank X customers. You can now bank, bank at the post office. Um, around those branch closures, I think there is far more that we should all be doing. Uh, and you may be aware the Economic Secretary of Treasury in, in uh, uh, UK government um, has challenged the banking community and the post office to do more, much more, to, to raise awareness. And it's something that we fully support. Um, general awareness in the population is around about 30 to 40 percent that you can bank in a post office. Uh, we, would, we would rather that was 60, 70 percent, we would, or as high as we can get it, to make sure everybody knows when a bank branch closes, post office is there for you. Yeah. And, and you've, you've indicated that the vast majority of post offices are franchises, part of another business. And there is concern out there that uh, there's a lack of privacy, there's concerns about security, and also about staff training. So, so what are you doing about addressing those issues? Um, take them in reverse order. Staff training, everybody who operates the post office system, post office terminal, has to go through terminal training before they, before they can uh, serve customers. So there's something like 300 different types of product that our, our systems support. Um, we train counter staff on every one of those before they, before they become uh, sort of customer serving. Um, in terms of security, uh, I, I recognise there's a privacy issue, and quite rightly, if you've got a, a, a very small branch and you've got someone purchasing convenience goods right beside someone wanting to withdraw a couple hundred pounds, there's a time and a place for that conversation. It is challenging. Um, but again, we have to recognise the physical infrastructure that we work in sometimes. Uh, in general, security has actually improved. Uh, there have been less um, instances of theft or crime or violence in the last two or three years as we've moved to a more open plan model. And it's the same thing with banks and other organisations that offer financial services like this, um, where you've got a counter in place and you've got people on either side of the counter. I don't know, what, I don't know why, but for some reason there is more attempted crime in that model than there is in an open plan one. I think it's to do with the amount of money that's, that's kept in an open plan area is less. The rest of it is in the safe, time locked. Um, it's an interesting statistic that's, that's probably worth further investigation as to why, but we see it's more secure um, at, at, at that open plan level. And in terms of the network itself, I mean, you made a point of saying between 2009 and today <coughs> was roughly 14, and that stayed fairly level at 1,400. Mm -hmm. You've only modernised 800 branches. I mean, is the intention to modernise the other 600, or is there a a danger of more branches closing. The reason for asking is that, of, as Jackie Bailey already mentioned, uh, in 2002 there was 1,900 branches in Scotland, 25% of the network's already been cut. And if you look online, there is currently 40 sub-postmasters got their business up for sale, uh, including one in my uh, constituency at Buxton, 
And the estimated fees that, that sub-postmasters earn is as little as £2,500 per annum. I mean, um, how stable is this 1,400 network? Um, it's, a, it's a very good challenge, uh, and I can't speak for some of my other product colleagues in terms of the overall product mix and remuneration, but as I've mentioned, in terms of banking, my own uh, area of responsibility, um, I recognise that business deposits uh, is, is the main one that postmasters have a, have a real challenge with, and we are working to address that in physical ways as well as uh, fixing the remuneration paid. Um, there is no doubt that the post office model just like every other retail model, is under pressure on the high street. Uh, and we have to continually look at it to make it a viable business. Uh, to a certain extent, we are mandated to be in the high street. That's what our government mandate is. 99.7% of the population should live within three miles of a post office. That's what we, that's what we deliver to. Um, to. To support that, we obviously need postmasters and mistresses to take up the challenge. We need to make that viable for them. Um, I have no... Um, no, uh, no challenge with, with your, your question that it is difficult in some instances to make that work. Uh, you've asked whether we're going to carry on um, refurbishing and renewing the, the estate. Absolutely we are, but again, it, it, it's, a, it's almost like a, um, a diminishing uh, graph, if you like. We've done the vast majority who are uh, wishing to, to take advantage of the, of the fund and to get modified and modernised, and we are working our way through the tail, and it's a large tail. It goes out to the Highlands and Islands, it goes out to the, the tips of Cornwall. Um, you know, in some of our remote locations, uh, we need to, to create that business model that's going to help, that will therefore sustain the post office, and therefore uh, we renew and refresh, and we keep it going. Okay. My, my last question is to uh, Gordon Buchanan. Um, Juniper Green, in my constituency, the post office, of, clo of course, closed be prior to the, the bank branches closing. And, um, you know, it was heartening to hear that Castle Community Bank is considering putting in a mobile, mobile bank vehicle. Can you give us any more information about that? Um, we are still in discussions with, um, with RBS um, um, around uh, the provision of one of their uh, uh, used uh, vehicles. Um, I'm hoping that that will, uh, that will happen very soon. Um, and the idea is that we would use that vehicle for two purposes. One, to promote the bank, um, and two, to, uh, to provide um, a, a mobile banking services in areas which aren't currently served. Although I understand RBS have now decided to provide some limited services in in that in your constituency um so watch the space we're still um we're getting there with rbs so things move slowly um so but um but we're confident that that will that that will come to pass very soon okay thanks very much and now andy whiteman thanks very much convener um martin you said um earlier about um the prospects of establishing a post bank i think that was one of the demands from the the consultation that was carried out on the post office services in 2016, um, but then, and you said that the risk there was that um, your existing customers might see that as a threat. But you, you talked about post office money, which is backed by Bank of Ireland, provides your ATM network, and already provides banking services. So why why do you not see the customers perceiving you that as a a threat to their existing banking as well? I mean, how actively are you, are you trying to persuade customers? to join what is, in effect, a bank, just not run by you? Um, yeah. We've got um, some tens of thousands of customers uh, in a post office current account right now. Um, you're quite right. The banks, when we, we worked with them to put the partner banking relationships together, were very concerned. They said, well, if we start sort of effectively shepherding customers into a post office, won't you just migrate them all onto a post office account? Um, and all of the banks got comfortable over the period of time we were, we were putting this partnership together, that actually we're all faced with marketing and advertising every minute of every day. And the, the likelihood of a customer coming into a post office wishing to withdraw some cash and at the same time going, you know what, I've never thought about a post office account before, I think I'll change, they all got comfortable with the fact that that is an unlikely thing to happen. That it is not something that's front of someone's mind when they think, I need to get £50 out for the weekend or you know, I need to pay a, a certain bill or whatever. So, we and in fact, it's been borne out in fact, since we've been serving the banks in the post offices, we've seen very little migration. Uh, we actually um, 
recuse ourselves, if that's the right word, we, we prevent ourselves from saying, I see you've got a, an RBS card, have you ever thought about a post office account? We do not poach at the counter, we just fulfill the transaction the customer wants. If, whilst they're in there, they see around them all of the advertising for pensions, for holiday insurance, for travel money, etc., and they think, oh, I'm away next week, I'll get some travel cash out, then of course they can take that service. But it's not a specific swap over the bank account. Um, so we don't, we don't try and force people to make that move. It's a, it's, a, it's a personal choice. We serve them at the counter for the transaction they want. But, but in your earlier comments, sorry, I don't recall everything, you, you, you were talking about, I think in response to Jackie Bailey's question, about setting up as a bank, as your own bank, you were arguing that would be difficult because it would be perceived as poaching customers. Um, my apologies if that was the impression. Maybe I can clarify. Um, what I was really trying to say was, if we were to invest a significant sum of money to create a post bank, you would need to create the return in order to make that worthwhile. To create the, the return, you would need to have several million, if not many million customers. We already serve them in every post office anyway. So how would we go about taking a large, sum of, a large group of customers and move them from their existing banking relationships across all the banks and move them onto a post office account? Um, it, it, it becomes financially, in my, my own mind, financially uh, challenging to have put that kind of investment in to create the post bank shell um, and then where do you find the customers from? All you could do is take them from the group that we already serve. So it becomes, it becomes kind of a self-defeating thing in the end. It's, it's, it's not something that I think we can make financially viable at this stage. It is constantly under review, um, and we will always be looking at new ways in which we can serve the communities best that we're in. But right now, I don't think with the re banking regulations as they are, we could create a post-bank that would be strong enough and sustainable enough without the support of many millions of customers be, uh, using it. Okay, that, that, does, that does help to clarify things. Thanks very much. Can you say something about your relationship with government um, and its intentions and aspirations and also the financial support it provides? Um, in, in general to the post office or uh, about banking in particular? Banking in particular. Banking in particular. Um, okay, so we work very closely with, uh, with um, our stakeholder as the post office, UK Government Investments, UKGI. Um, and we work very closely with them uh, in how we encourage and raise awareness of banking services. Uh, so working through UKGI and into Treasury, um, Treasury, the EST, uh, issued the letter to post offices and to the banking communities to say, do more. You need to raise awareness. How are you going to do it? You can't just leave communities when the bank branch closes. You need to tell people about the alternatives. So we work very closely with UKGI, with Treasury, with DWP in servicing the POCA, uh, account, as I mentioned earlier, they're the three main departments that we work with. We've heard evidence from some small businesses that they don't see the post office as a viable alternative to um, their local bank branch. Um, from what you said this morning, um, it seems that you are. I mean, what work have you done with the business community, small business community, to um, demonstrate to them the kind of services that you can provide and how aware are they of that? Um, it's a very good question and I've read through the previous submissions and um, I would possibly most charitably say some of the contributions possibly have been looking back at things that were in the past and are not looking at how we've tried to change things. Um, with the small business community in particular, uh, I recognise in Scotland in particular with, um, with Royal Bank of Scotland and Bank of Scotland as part of Lloyd's, uh, it's only recently in the last year or two that we have been able to bring on board the this, this small to medium enterprise sector for those banks to be served in post offices. So that's kind of a, a new or an emerging area. Uh, across the UK, we've been serving um, small customers for many years. Santander, for instance, um, their small business customers can't use a Santander branch. They can only use a post office. So we have got... Uh, very that Santander's yes. policy that they want uh, to keep their branches for big businesses? Um, it's certainly their policy. I think it's it may be an IT related issue. Okay. The systems in their branches um, came from a different generation and don't support the, the business community. Okay. Um, however, we can. Uh, so we support 100% of Santander's small businesses and we support them exceptionally well. Uh, we handle over 30 million transactions a year uh, for them. Um, so we have got very well developed ways in which cash can be deposited in to the, to the, to, uh, the post office, into their bank account. Um, 
increasingly for those banks that have recently joined us, RBS Bank of Scotland, uh, we are doing exactly those kind of services. Uh, and we're, we're improving things for postmasters by being able to provide uh, note counters, especially with polymer notes coming through. Um, the, the, the chance of counterfeit is less, but there, still you have to count the cash. Um, so what we've asked the business community to do, and we're getting some great buy-in from them, is that we, we only support, support full coin bags, so that makes it easier. You know, Postmaster's not counting lots of uh, you know, pennies and two p's and five p's, full bags only. Notes are counted, counterfeits are found. Um, post postmasters will no longer be liable for fraudulent um, notes that come through the system. If they find them using the, the, the facilities that we offer, they are no longer liable. So we're trying to make things better for the postmasters to accept uh, these sort of services in from, from, uh, from businesses. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Thank you, and now Jamie Halko Johnson. Um, I was just wondering what the, the barriers are. I mean, there's a number of issues we've, we've covered already, too, but what are the barriers are for um, the post office providing more services or supporting credit unions and credit union prov uh, customers accessing services um, through your branches? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of credit unions, we, we, we talked briefly uh, before we, we joined you this morning. Um, we've been working with um, some credit union aggregators, uh, and by that I mean these are companies who can take the different types of output from individual credit unions, uh, mostly electronic, I mean, these, we, there's not a great deal we can do for cash box and a notebook. Uh, some of the smallest credit unions we probably can't serve in post offices. However, any that have, that from the larger areas, uh, that have electronic systems that feed out information. We're working with some of those aggregators to be able to provide service in, um, in every post office across the country for access to those credit union accounts. As I mentioned earlier, they'd typically be proper kind of bank accounts, if you like, they're transactional accounts, um, and that's a service that we're looking to deliver over this next few months. So it is really trying to offer a wider branch network to credit unions that otherwise don't have any. And, and would that, that wouldn't be limited to say that, for example, say it would only be your branches in Glasgow that would offer um, services for Glasgow credit unions, it would be, you could access them a completely nationwide? Nationwide, absolutely. Okay. Can I get an opinion from... Could you answer yourself? Um, just, I mean, we, we very much welcome that. Um, it, it's, a, I think, an exciting opportunity, and we, we look forward to working with the post office to sort of encourage that. Um, I, I guess you, you referred to barriers. I guess the I, the only barrier would be that all credit unions are not a sort of, they're not a chain. Um, they're all in different systems. They all have their own priorities and their own resources. So um, I guess the sort of, the neat solution would be that you could access all credit union services with no post office branches. It's, it's sort of difficult to get to that point, but um, we welcome the direction of travel on that. And credit unions will will have to work more closely together, or, or, or perhaps maybe standardise some of the services to allow that wider access in the future, or just as a kind of model going forward. Yeah, I think there's a sort of if we're going to overcome some of the challenges that I mentioned about you know technology and that sort of thing. Um, I think there's inevitability that we'll need to work together to, to achieve that. Um, it, it's not always easily done, um, particularly if you know, some of them are competing with each other for the same, the same customers. So, um, yeah, I agree that's probably something we'd like to see more of. Yeah. Uh, can, can I ask you along, along the kind of same lines uh, a little bit, um, from, from both the credit unions and from the post office, what the kind of particular challenges are for delivering services or, or, or attracting customers in rural areas, remote areas like Highlands and Islands and, and other parts of Scotland? Um, I think the, the challenge that we face uh, is one of supply chain. Uh, it's making sure that all of those communities have the same access to cash uh, as we would uh, offer to the rest of the, rest of the country. Um, even some of the, you just mentioned uh, earlier on about additional services. Around those basic cash services, we also offer check handling, uh, coin, change, um, and we're constantly working with people at the FSB to try and work on new services that would be valuable in that transactional spirit uh, for small businesses. Um, for checks, for instance, in the Highlands and Islands, it can take an extra day or two to get the checks physically into the system so that we can get them to the bank and get them processed. Um, again, I read one of the submissions talking about how you know, post office loses checks. Uh, I'd like to defend and, de and, uh, and challenge that. We handle many millions of checks uh, every year, and that's growing very rapidly, actually, um, as places to deposit them become less and less. Um, so we're seeing about a 50, 60% growth in check handling each year. Uh, there are occasions when, for some of the smaller or uh, less mainstream banks, 
we still accept checks in, and literally what happens at the central distribution center, which is an industry center called IPSL, um, they, will be, they will be literally posted out to the bank. Um, now, in some cases, maybe those go adrift, but they are one in several hundred thousand, if not one in a million. So we, we offer a very secure service for physically handling cash and checks. The challenge we have is to get, is to get it out there. Uh, in some cases, uh, in, the, in, the, in the furthest aisles, it's by boat. Uh, and you can imagine that the, the, the physical nature of those services means it, it takes time. The issues that obviously, I'm from Orkney and we have a small sub uh, post office in the in the area where I live. One of the issues is opening hours. Obviously, it's there, the lim opening hours are very limited and probably wouldn't suit businesses. So, is that something in the future? Do you think you may look to to revise whether more longer opening hours can be made available, business friendly, more consumer friendly? Well, we're, we're looking at a number of areas. Exactly that. I think if if I just refer back to an earlier answer, that about four thousand of our branches handle the vast majority of business uh, deposits. Um, Specifically, we are open as a network about 400,000 hours a week more than we were several years ago. There are 4,000 branches open on uh, weekends, on Sundays. Uh, we open late into the evening. So businesses that would otherwise have to shut, let's say on a Thursday afternoon, drive to the nearest town to go and do their banking, that loses them 5% of their week. Now, we all know the high street is under pressure. That 5% trade may well be their profit for the week gone. So if we stay open longer, so someone can bank on their way home, or they can bank at weekends, we are offering a lifeline to those local businesses. Um, as we look to the future, what we look to do in the, in the broadest part of the network is potentially to automate. And that means uh, you know, a box with a post office rotating on the top of it, um, some sort of uh, automated device into which cash deposits can be made. Uh, there's not just an ATM for cash withdrawals, but the ability to offer services 24-7 in secure locations. I'll come back if that's right to the credit unions just a second, but I do want to push on this. I mean, obviously the changes that are going to require, you've got new new customers, uh, you say, joining. It, as a kind of slightly topical thing at the moment about IT um, resilience, uh, would you see uh, you having to improve your systems um, to, to meet kind of demand like that? A hostage to fortune. Um, we have, as you say, <laughs> clearly seen the, uh, the, the challenges in the last week. And... Um, in particular, uh, over the weekend, we were on standby uh, with um, cash delivery ready to go if those particular problems carried on and there was a demand for cash across the country. Um, I think it was a sort of a, a salient point to us all that we are not yet a cashless economy um, and actually we shouldn't become a cashless economy. Cash will be king for a number of years to come. Uh, even in eight or nine years' time, it'll still be 30% of, of, the, of the transactions in the country will be cash-based. On standby, was that just on your own actions or was that within consultation with the banks? That was just on our own actions. That was just thinking, actually, if this carries on and people can't buy fuel, they can't buy food, how do we keep the ATMs going? How do we open the branches longer? How do we supply them with cash? Um, so we off our own back just to try and keep that going. Your point about the IT system is, is very relevant. Um, None of us running large national infrastructures can say with certainty that there's never going to be a problem. All we can do is plan for the worst cases that do happen, have contingency built in place, uh, disaster recovery and business continuity plans, um, and we have those very well advanced, very well developed in terms of what do we do if our system cannot, uh, can't operate. Can I just ask, ask a very quick last question as well? Um, bearing in mind what um, Jackie uh, Bailey and Gordon MacDonald mentioned about kind of potential branch closures, obviously the Highlands Islands have seen a number of, of sub post offices close. I imagine you'll have proje uh, projections in terms of what the, the numbers of post offices looking to the future. Can you tell, tell us whether that will be increased, decreased, the same? Our, our plans at present are to increase. Um, we, uh, just to give you some further detail, and thank you to my colleague for helping with the, the detail, there are actually 133 post offices still to be modernised uh, across Scotland. We've modernised 774. Um, there are 21 directly managed branches in, the, in, in, uh, in Scotland. And of the remainder, 485, we support with a community fund. That community fund is in excess of £10 million. That's where we... Um, there are two separate funds, in fact. One is that we pay to keep what might be the Highlands and Islands post offices open. And it's almost the last phone box type model still. There are certain branches that will never make a profit, but they are absolutely fundamental to the community they serve. So we pay to keep those open. We support them with uh, circa 10 million pound um, community fund, which is to help 
organize retail businesses in support of the post office. So if you're running a convenience store, we will help you with displays, we'll help you with how you set out the, the, the floor space in your, in your, uh, in your premises. Um, that's what that community fund is for. So that's to absolutely make sure that we, that we keep those community um, businesses going. Thanks very much. Can I just very quickly um, ask Karen Hurst some of the kind of particular issues facing people in the Highlands and Islands? Obviously, you talked, I think we spoke earlier about, maybe Cathy Gregg talked about 15 miles round trips. I mean, that's a fairly standard, possibly short uh, trip in, the, in some parts of the Highlands and Islands, um, just a, a doddle really for many. So can you tell us about some of the kind of issues that people may face in the Highlands and Islands and, and the credit unions may face in terms of setting up? Yeah, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure it's something I've got a very good answer on. The Highlands and Islands are... are sort of the, the biggest credit unions are High Scottish Credit Union. Um, they seem to be seeing good growth. They're, they're a strong credit union, although if I'm being honest, I'm not sure that they're really um, providing the sort of cash service and the services that people will be looking for if their banks are closing. Um, so, sorry, I'm not sure I've got a, a sort of good response on that matter. <laughs> I'm not as rural as that, but we, we have areas that, that are out with our common bond, and the credit unions are trying to adapt People can email, telephone, we pay by backs. As long as cheques are payable to the credit union, they can post cheques in. From the new money laundering, credit unions can't accept cheques now made payable to the member. So that has caused quite a lot of problems in the community because children get cheques from grandparents, things like that we can no longer process these cheques. But if the cheque is payable to the credit union, they can post it in and it'll be credited in their, their account. We try to pay cash the next day if we receive an email or a text. And I imagine every credit union is using the, the same technology just now. We're all trying to upgrade to have our apps and our, our IT that appeals to the younger generation. We're trying to do that ourselves at the Vale of Leaving just now, but it costs a lot of money. It, it, it comes down to finances, <coughs> trying to give rural people the, the best service. Right now, it's a telephone call. I need my my money in my bank or an email, we, we accept that. And that's how most credit unions are still dealing with the rural areas. Thank you. As best as we can in the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. And Gillian Martin. <coughs> Good morning. Um, we've been asking most panels a similar question just to see what different responses we get from the various stakeholders in this whole uh, bank branch closures inquiry. And it's what, in your opinion, do you think the Scottish and UK governments, if anything, could do to ameliorate the impact, the negative impact of the bank branch closures? Maybe from your perspective, maybe if it's helping you occupy that space, if that's what you want to do in any way, um, I'll throw it open to you all. We've outgrown our office. I have a, a credit union in Alexandria just beside Balloch. We've outgrown our office. We have four million pounds in savings. We have 4,000 active members, 1,000 junior savers. We have just over three million pounds out in lending, but we are compact in our premises. So we heard the Royal Bank was leaving the high street. We approached the Royal Bank. We approached the council. We approached the agent acting on behalf of the Royal Bank. We got absolutely nowhere till the Royal Bank moved out and left the place like a bomb site. Bare wires, the electronic doors, all they disconnected. Estimated about 100,000 to make it usable. So it will lie empty in our community because it's not suitable for retail. It has the wee tiny windows. That will be an empty building in our community till whenever. There is no joined up between the agencies, between the banks, the councils, Nobody seems to know what, what anyone else is doing to give help to any any other company that could use these buildings. The bank just rips them out and goes. You also have the ATM. They've left their ATM, but whoever takes the building must keep the ATM. And that can be a restriction sometimes as well, because if the credit union or anybody else moves into it, they have to build in a secure area for the ATM. Should be something done in the way of and that be UK government in terms of when you the last when banks vacate a building that there's certain um, restrictions put on what they can and can't do with that building uh, if there, or, or or do you think that's I going don't too think far? they should just be allowed to strip it bare and leave it like, like a ugly 
parasite on the, in, in the town centre. It just looks <coughs> awful. And it will be like that for, for long enough because the rents and the rates on it will be prohibitive to anyone else taking it over. So the, the council's not making an income out of it. It's lying empty. We would have moved into it if they'd left it in a half reasonable state. So somebody should be looking to see what's... It's, it's a council-owned building. So somebody should have been watching to see what was happening when they moved out. Does anyone else get any thoughts on, on, on what the, the, either government or local authorities could be doing? Well, just picking up on that particular point and uh, thinking about Mr McDonald's constituency and Juniper Green, that RBS building has closed. And I know that um, I think Professor Beavers gave evidence to the committee last week. I know he's been trying to uh, to speak to RBS about somehow taking over that building in some way to use it as a a, a community hub and and we've been thinking about uh, how we could how we could fit in with that but I know that um, they've got absolutely nowhere with that um, my suspicion is that eventually it will be demolished and some flats will be built if, the, if they get planning permission um, but just in in general about um, you know steps that could be taken I think. Uh, I've, I've noted a few things uh, on, on this, actually. Um, uh, legislation, I suppose, could be passed, which mean, and I'm not suggesting a full public inquiry on every bank branch closure, but legislation could be passed that means that the banks have to consult with the local community before they close the branch. They have to talk so to the... It's the banking uh, standard that makes it not voluntary and also includes a consultation. I know RBS, yeah. will, RBS will talk yeah. to the local community on a voluntary basis, for example, but I think it should perhaps be laid down in legislation that they have to consult. Um, and as I say, I'm not suggesting a full-blown public inquiry because of every branch closure, but I think that would be important. The second thing I've noted down here is that the banks maybe should be required to provide funding in the communities uh, where they close branches to, to open up a community bank or a credit union to somehow provide some... Uh, the credit union community bank isn't going to replace the services that the, that the retail bank were offering, but provide somewhere for small businesses to de deposit cash, for example. Um, um, so that's another example, I think, of what... And just picking up on what Cathy uh, said about, you know, that, that, that they're obliged to keep the, uh, the ATM, I think this is a really important point, which I think I mentioned earlier on, is that when the branch goes, the ATM goes. And I think perhaps the, the, the retail banks should be obliged, that if they are going to close the branch, then they have to maintain an ATM in that in, in either that branch or in a in a, in a in a in a in an adjacent building, basically, and be responsible for maintaining it, filling it, giving people access to cash in that in that in that community. So those are the those are the things I noted down about that particular question. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just sort of reiterate some of what I've touched on already. Um, we see it very much as a journey, but we hope that both uh, governments will continue to support the credit union sector to grow and to become stronger and, and hopefully to play a, a bigger role. Um, as I said earlier, in terms of the UK government, I think the main things we could do is look at um, reform in the Credit Unions Act to, to help us um, be a bit more relevant to our members and also maybe consider some of the capital requirements uh, that reforms you'd like to see? Yeah, so at the moment the Credit Unions Act um, basically sets out that credit unions can do savings and loans and not much else. They can offer some sort of additional services around that so they can offer insurance on your uh, loans and your savings. We would like to be in a position where we could um, provide a more holistic financial service to our members. So for example, um, in offering you know, maybe credit cards or or insurance or maybe contents insurance and that sort of thing and when we look at other um, countries where the credit union sector is much better developed personal lending is actually only a tiny percentage of what they do whereas in this country it's it's almost all they do so we think that the, there's real potential for the sector to grow if we could get that reform in place um, as I said earlier we we think that the newly introduced capital requirements for larger credit unions are restrictive and it's making them difficult it's making it difficult for them to grow um, in terms of the Scottish Government, I mean, the, I guess the main issue would be that of visibility. Um, they, they have been uh, very supportive. I mentioned the um, campaign that they're going to launch later this year, earlier. But I think just continue to um, to help us sort of 
get in, in particular to workplaces and that sort of thing to serve people who um, maybe wouldn't think of joining a credit union but actually um, you know will probably find it's in their benefit and I think there's also potential for some investment in the sector if they were looking to do that so um, not so much in sort of grant funding but uh, grant funding but not so much in sort of, kind of ongoing funding um, because we we place a great deal of importance on being sustainable but and things it's difficult for us to raise funds in. So I mentioned capital earlier and also technology and that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm right in thinking that the, the, the FCA are amenable to the uh, the services that a credit union offers being extended. I think yeah. they will say, they say, not you can you can do what you want, but they they say you can extend the services, you can offer other products, for example, yeah. capital or offering. There's a bit of a debate mortgages. going on right now as to whether or not it needs reform or whether um, it's within their um, their ability to just to to sort of interpret the act yes. in a way that we would like. Um, I, I think um, there, there may be not been as... Um, yeah, I think we would like them to be a bit looser in their interpretation. Uh -huh. um, ultimately, uh, we feel that perhaps it'll, it would end up having to be um, reform of the act that would just sort of uh, that, that would uh, make a final decision on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from McGregor. Yeah, thanks, Camino. I was just following one from uh, Gillian Martin's line of questioning there around uh, processes that could be put into place if there's to be a bank closure in a community. Uh, but do you think that, um, it, it, which I totally agree with, but do you think at the very least, if it's the last bank in town, the phrase it's so often coined, there should be something put in place? Uh, that the bank is, has a duty to look at that that building, that site, uh, for some form of community use, if it's viable. Absolutely. Yeah, this is what we're we're picking up on. Often, the you know, often I believe these these bank branches are actually you know they're owned by the bank. The site is owned by the bank, and 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 I'm sure in in the majority of cases, you know, the bank will be. Uh, looking to, to to sell the land for for um, for housing and, and and I'm sure that's what's happening in in, in most cases. But yes, I, I agree. I think there should be some responsibility on them to consult with the local community. And if they are the last uh, the last bank in town, that um, something should be done with that building that doesn't just involve the bank making even more money <laughs> out of um, out of uh, out of the branch being closed. So some sort of legal definition, perhaps, around the last back in town? Because my understanding is it's only a, a, a concept that's been used. Yes. What that could lead though to is to, uh, uh, I suppose, what that could lead to is a, is a rush to get out of the town so you're not the last bank in town. <laughs> that, 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 you know, that, that, that could, uh, you know, we wouldn't want to make the, 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 the responsibilities of the last bank in town to Duconian, because otherwise, as I say, there would be a rush to, you know, not be the not be the last one. Um, I think if I could just absolutely confirm your point, Gordon, um, we have seen exactly that. That uh, you know, a couple of banks over the past few years have said, "We won't leave. You know, you can rely on us." And unfortunately, with the with the rush to exit, and they've discovered that they are the last bank in town, they've then subsequently changed their mind because the way that the public is using banking uh, is just for cash in some of those areas. Uh, so we've all seen you know, someone with a clipboard desperate to talk to you as you walk into the branch, head straight to the cash point, take some money, walk out again, and they can't do anything with their clipboard. They can't talk to us. We're just in for one task only. And I think that's accelerated exactly as you say. The sort of the uh, uh, well, we don't want to be we don't want to be here anymore. We said we'd be the last, but we can't be, so we're going as well. Um, so I think you know, in terms of some sort of community. Uh, community role for the for the buildings um, not related to financial services absolutely there could be something that says you must do something for the local community especially in under pressure high streets in terms of financial services that community hub uh, I would propose is best served by a post office I mean we're there as I said within 100 yards of 45 of the closing RBS branches there's a post office from any of the other panelists if not, um, thank you very much for coming in today, and I'll now suspend the meeting and move to private session. Thank you.